This is Webster Tarpley speaking to you once again from Washington, D.C., but I am back from a press tour of the war zone near Donetsk in the Donetsk People's Republic. 72 hours in that uh, city. It is not besieged, but it is close to the fighting front. Fighting front about 10 to 12 kilometers north and northwest of the city. And I was certainly in an area where you could hear the chatter of the machine guns and the wump bop of the mortars and the thud of the 150 millimeter guns being used by the Ukrainian fascist army. And that's the first finding to put it all uh, in perspective. There is the Minsk II Accord. Who is violating the Minsk II Accord? I will tell you as an eyewitness, it is the Ukrainian forces, the pro-Kiev forces, the ones we refer to here in their proper name as the Ukrainian fascist forces. So here it is now the afternoon of Friday, the 24th of April, and I'm talking about a tour that uh, lasted Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of the previous week. I can tell you that if you were in the Akhtyabrskaya, October Revolution, Akhtyabrskaya neighborhood of uh, Donetsk, again on the northwest side of the city, if you were there on Thursday, the 16th of April in the morning, you would have heard plenty of firing coming from the Ukrainian lines. So who is violating Minsk to Kiev and its fascist satellites are violating Minsk too? Now we'll talk about, try to give you an impression of what this, this looks like on the ground. But the big news is something else. It's the policies of the Donetsk People's Republic. It is a People's Republic. It is the product of a mass strike carried out by the middle class with a prominent role for industrial workers, coal miners in particular, who make up the uh, backbone of the local economy. Donetsk is, of course, a coal mining town, and the same holds true for this entire Donbass area, formerly Ukraine, now, I think, on its well on its way to being an independent country, the Donetsk People's Republic. And all over the horizon, whenever you're driving around in this uh, Donetsk Oblast, as it had been in Soviet times, that uh, this uh, area, you can see these slag heaps all over. Some of them look, some of them look like they're about as big as South Mountain just north here of uh, Washington, D.C. Some of them look like the pyramids, but wherever you are, you're always going to see these slag heaps, the ash and other byproducts from coal mining on the horizon. So the big headline, though, and I think in this I am giving you a scoop in terms of the international press coverage. Certainly nothing that I have seen has done justice to it. There is a social revolution going on in Donetsk. The Donetsk People's Republic is obviously not bound by the International Monetary Fund. They're not members. They're not bound by the World Trade Organization. They're not bound by any of these global loanee financier-dominated institutions, and they are making the most of it. And I would like to focus, without further ado, on what I regard as the centerpiece of this entire tour – it was a conversation which I had along with the, uh, the group that I was with. The group that I was with included people from uh, Italy, from the Czech Republic, from Canada, actually two from Canada, um, uh, a guy from the Netherlands, uh, and, and some others. Uh, this was organized with the help of Europa Objektiv, that is a uh, website uh, that presents the a Russian case primarily to a German audience, uh, but they made this possible. My gratitude to them is great, and here's what we found. We had the occasion to meet with a guy that you've got to get to know. His name is Boris Alexeyevich 
Litvinov, L-I-T-V-I-N-O-V. Now, you remember, if you're historically inclined, as we try to be here, Maxim Litvinov was the foreign minister of the uh, USSR, of the Soviet Union, uh, different times in the 1930s. Boris Alexeyevich Litvinov. Now, who is, who is Litvinov? Litvinov is just the Thomas Jefferson of his country. He's the guy who wrote, or at least drafted, he assembled the final draft of the Declaration of Independence of the Donetsk People's Republic. And uh, he is a highly interesting figure. For a while there, he was prime minister of the country, uh, and he remains, I believe, a member of the Council of Ministers, and he seems to be at the leading edge of a series of economic reforms, economic reforms which are being adapted, adopted by the Donetsk People's Republic under the gun of military necessity, to be sure, but also in a way that may be full of promise and portent for the Russian Federation, for other areas, and maybe for the world. Let's, uh, let's get into it. So, again, it was on the night of April 6th to April 7th last year, last April, that uh, a committee was formed in uh, the area, and it included uh, three people, Litvinov, along with uh, Cherkashin and uh, Purgin. These were the three. It's a little bit like the committee we had here, right? Thomas Jefferson, along with um, Benjamin Franklin, and so forth. So uh, it was, however, Litvinov who stayed up all night and wrote the draft. Uh, so he is, in some ways, the the father of the uh, of the country. Now, the the current president. Uh, was actually elected uh, by a vote, and that's uh, Zakarchenko. So we'll we'll get to him in a minute. But let's get to the uh, the the meat of the economics. You go in and meet Litvinov, and he's uh, he's a guy in a business suit with a tie. Uh, let me point out that what you read about the formation of the DNR or DPR, Donetsk Donetskaya Narodnaya Respublik, or Donetsk People's Republic. Uh, on wiki, uh, Wikipedia, we say this entity was declared on 7th of April 2014 by a group of armed and masked militants led by Igor Girkin, who was occupying the regional administration. This is a monstrous uh, distortion. This was uh, declared by a committee of, I think, very cultured and very uh, experienced administrators and government officials going back to the Soviet era, they had seen these transitions, uh, and they carefully checked the precedents under international law to make sure that their declaration of independence uh, conformed, as much as possible, to the uh, outlines that were given uh, by the United Nations and others. So now you go in and meet this uh, very affable uh Litvinov, Boris Litvinov. So what does he start telling you? He says, first of all, you have to understand that the basis of our state building, the construction of the new Donetsk People's Republic, is uh, on the basis of a, uh, a, a firm refusal, rejection of the fascist ideology. Actually, he says national fascist ideology, which dominated and dominates the Maidan or Euro-Maidan movement, the forces that continue to rule in Kiev. So they are anti-fascist, and that's just the beginning. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in uh, Washington, D.C., reporting on my visit last week to the Donetsk People's Republic, where I met the foreign minister, the information minister, and uh, I believe a member of the Council of Ministers, but certainly an important leader in the uh, in the parliament of the country, and that is Boris Alexeyevich Litvinov, 
uh, who seems to be one of the decisive people in terms of the economic policy. He's preparing a document, and let, let me appeal right now. For those who can, please start monitoring the uh, news reports coming out of this area in Ukrainian and or Russian, because they're going to release this economic policy document soon, if it hasn't already happened. And this is something that the world has to find out about. And I propose, since I've got the basis now, to, to continue reporting about this. So keep monitoring my Twitter feed. I will be catching up now over this weekend with a, a large number of uh, Twitters so that we can get this uh, very interesting word out. So Litvinov says, first of all, the basis of the new Donetsk People's Republic is the firm rejection of the national fascist ideology, which is the essence of the Kiev Maidan, the Kiev government, the Pornoshenko, Yatsenyuk, Yarosh uh, monstrosity taking shape there in, in Kiev. This includes the resolute rejection of Russia as an enemy image. No Russian enemy image. Kein Russisches Feindbild. It is excluded. Uh, rather, this is a government which wants to give priority to the development of infrastructure. Infrastructure. They're already miles, million miles ahead of uh, a lot of people here in the West. The, the basis of the new government is the development of the economy and the infrastructure. They formally reject the organization of the economy according to oligarchical principles. No oligarchy, says uh, Litvinov. That will not be tolerated, has not been uh, tolerated. And they reject the neoliberal ideology. Neoliberalism is formally rejected. So no to national fascism. No to oligarchy, no to neoliberalism, and instead an emphasis on infrastructural development. Now, perhaps the most uh, dramatic. They have nationalized the banking system of the country. Every bank has been seized by the authorities. All banks are now under the control of the Donetsk People's Republic. Now, that's probably more than just about any place else in the world has been able to accomplish up to now. And uh, some of these are being kept open. Uh, I think it's fair to say that um, even Donetsk, uh, like many places in uh, the former Soviet Union, is overbanked. So a lot of these branch banks are being shut down. But the bank that belonged to Kolomoisky, the uh, oligarch, the, the neo-feudal uh, Boyar, I guess, who uh, has been causing so much trouble. I think he's actually he's on the run right now. They've kept that open for the purpose of paying pensions and social benefits. So the, the dynamic was that the Kiev uh, fascist regime decided to cut the payment of pensions. They said, well, we're not going to pay pensions to you people out there in those rebellious areas. So the uh, government in Donetsk has now said we're going to force the Kolomoisky Bank to start paying these pensions and other benefits. And I have pictures and I am an eyewitness of the lines of people uh, crowding around the offices of this one bank, several, you know, many branches, but one uh, banking uh, logo that were kept open in order to pay these pensions. So it is the banking system practically at the disposal of the people. So, banks nationalized. That's pretty good for starters. I hope you will agree. Uh, Litvinov points out that the economic policy they have uh, been developing has been done in cooperation with two economic institutes in Moscow. And I hope to find out more about those economic uh, institutes in Moscow because I think they may be regarding the Donetsk Donbass as a laboratory for uh, new programs that can actually be applied inside uh, Russia. That's just a guess uh, that I have. So Litvinov says, we do not deny private initiative. There's plenty of room for individual uh, entrepreneurs. However, it will be according to criteria established uh, by the uh, government, by the state. 
So this amounts to what we've been preaching here for many, many a moon. It is dirigism. Dirigism is being installed in the Donetsk and other uh, areas. So what does this look like? First of all, the state control of national resources. Uh, it means in particular that there's a large coal mining industry. And Litvinov talked about the intentions that they have to develop this coal mining industry further. It, it simply shows if you are a left liberal Malthusian mushhead here in the United States, you are painting yourself out of world history because the, the things that you think are important are not the ones that are important out there in the real world. Uh, coal. Uh, one, I saw a newspaper headline, there will be coal. Yes, there will be coal. There will be economic uh, survival. Uh, and that, of course, requires its own infrastructure. It requires repairs to the existing infrastructure. As Litvinov said, they need rail development. They've got to develop their railroads, and they need rolling stock. They need gondola cars and other rolling stock, other railroad cars, freight cars, because so many have been destroyed in the fighting unleashed by Kiev starting last spring and last summer. However, this government is determined to do one of the most basic things that any government should and must do. Be the world leader in something. Be the world leader in some area of high-tech, high-energy uh, density, high-capital intensity production. And uh, Litvinov says, for the Donetsk People's Republic, it is machine tools that are connected to coal. Machine tools used for coal mining. And they propose to become the world leader in that area through exports. And they have already received delegations from China and Vietnam interested in buying the world-class technology, which Donetsk has uh, in this area. So machine tools and the coal mining uh, industry. Uh, they also have significant capabilities in the construction area, right? Civil engineering and building all kinds of things. They are talking to German companies about expanding that. Uh, one of the things he also pointed out is there's a shortage of bricks, and I mean ceramic bricks, and so the bricks that a bricklayer would lay down. There's also news about the bricks bank, but right now he's talking about bricks. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio program recorded here on the 24th of uh, April 2015. Just back from the war zone in Donetsk, Donetsk People's Republic, and reporting on the economic revolution going on in this small part of Europe, which nevertheless happens to be the one area where you don't have the European Union, you don't have the uh, World Trade Organization, you don't have the IMF, you don't have the World Bank, you don't have any of that, and you can then go ahead and write your own ticket. So the nationalization of the banks, the government control over natu national, natural and national resources and energy, uh, as we've just been going through it, uh, energy in general, electricity is under government control. It has been de facto nationalized there will be due process, but for the moment, it is responding to the uh, imperatives, the directives given by the government in Donetsk. Uh, and the simile for the natural resources, coal is being revived, and that is one of the key tasks of the government. By the way, Litvinov said, uh, Royal Dutch Shell came by, and they wanted to take over our coal industry. And the answer was no. And Hunter Biden came by and he wanted, or his emissaries, he wanted to take over the coal industry. And the answer was no again. Now, uh, the other area, of course, coal is one thing. The, the black in the uh, Donetsk flag, as he said, the black can be one of two things if you want. It can be coal, tremendous coal area, one of the great coal mining areas of the world. Always with these, uh, at, the, at the top of the mine shaft, these... Uh, large wheeled contraptions that control the uh, the elevators up and down and so forth. So one side is called, the other is the Black Earth region. Either among 
the best agricultural areas in the world or maybe the best agricultural area in the world is the Ukrainian black earth region. When you drive around, you can see how black and rich that earth is. So uh, what's going on there? It's something beyond an agricultural cooperative, not an agricultural cooperative, uh, although in many ways similar, but he said it can be compared to a collective farm, a kolkhoz, that some people have decided to go into this cooperative plus mode uh, in order to increase agricultural production. So uh, the fascinating topic, right? We're, we're hoping for updates on all of this when we get that critical economic report of the government, which, as he said, is needed so that the average person can understand what's going on. Now, at the other end of the uh, food chain, supermarkets, right, Re- retail sales of food, they have o- proudly opened their first state-controlled supermarket. You can see what, what's going on here is the creation of a state sector, not wiping out the private sector, but supplementing it and uh, competing with it, as, uh, as the uh, people would say. So the state supermarket, I've been in it, it's beautiful, it's clean, it's new, it's shiny, it is well stocked with everything. And I hope my pictures came out. Uh, we'll take a look at that when, as soon as I get a chance. But uh, I had lunch uh, based on what I bought in a the uh, Donetsk People's Republic first opened state supermarket. So a, uh, a state sector there also. Now, uh, all this with the help of these two institutes in Moscow that we would hope to uh, to uh, to determine uh, unions. Unions are important. The unions are uh, heavily represented in the parliament. Uh, one, one factor, I think, is, is part of the representation is according to um, economic and social organizations that uh, are, are assigned representation. And the unions are pr- uh, represented there. Uh, there is a minimum wage. As he said, it's very low, but it's better than the Kiev minimum wage. So no matter what you might say about the, the insufficiency, as, as Litvinov himself agreed, the insufficient minimum wage in uh, Donetsk People's Republic is still better than the minimum wage in uh, Kiev. Now, a currency reform is underway, and I have, I believe, if my pictures come out, I have a picture of, uh, well, what he called, it's not a monetary uh, unit, he calls it a currency token, uh, valutni znak, the znak, right, a symbol. But I would say token. There's a bit of a problem translating this because it is something new. Anyway, they have this new monetary uh, symbol, this new currency token. So people out there who are uh, concerned about monetary reform, there's something for you uh, too. So... Uh, Let's also talk about some really fundamental things. In this world of cultural pessimism and historical pessimism, the government in Donetsk has thrown aside Malthus and his odious doctrines, and they have embarked on a policy of population growth, and they say it loud and clear. So according to Litvinov, uh, at the time, at the end of the Soviet Union, the population of the Donetsk Oblast province was about 5 million people. And by the time we got to, say, 2012, 2013, before the big troubles started, uh, it was uh, about 4 million. So Litvinov says we have to promote population growth. One of the other projects, of course, is to recover the areas of the Donetsk and indeed the Lugansk oblasts, which have been taken over by the fascists, right? In other words, to kick them off the uh, the territory of the old two uh, oblasts there. But um, that's only the beginning. But in any case, you've got to have population growth. So uh, the word is 
that the government is going to encourage, obviously encourage family formation, encourage marriage, and encourage uh, procreation. And family values will be backed up by economic um, facilitations, right, to encourage and make possible the population growth. And the target is they would like to see three children per family, three children per woman, I guess would be another way uh, to put it, uh, to, to stimulate. And as I, I pointed out, I said, this is the language of General de Gaulle. General de Gaulle said 100 million Frenchmen. It's called le natalisme, natalism. Um, Abraham Lincoln has elements of it in some little known uh, writings. But the population has to uh, be increased. And he talks in the rigorous scientific category, and this is, this is right from his own uh, lips, expanded reproduction. One of the keys to, uh, to my economics and any, any decent economics is you've got to account for and stimulate the expanded reproduction of society. And that means all the inputs, all the economic inputs that go into making up the uh, standard of living of a population. They reject the social Darwinist struggle for survival. They don't want any part of that. They have an ambitious program which um, will avoid the pitfalls of Malthusianism and neoliberalism. And again, the moment of dirigism, state control, it's a highly regulated approach. Uh, let's see. The currency... Uh, element is also there. So you get the, uh, the idea of in the middle of this emergency, but taking advantage of the relatively free hand that is there, they're moving in industry, in infrastructure, in the mining sector, in the black earth, uh, area. They're promoting machine tool building. You get the idea of a, a comprehensive and ambitious program, which it is our responsibility to support. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So we've been giving you a summary of a very important meeting with Boris Alexeyevich Litvinov of the government of the Donetsk People's Republic, the Thomas Jefferson of the country, the guy who stayed up all night drafting it. It was not some gang of thugs, but it was uh, some people who have... I think very advanced concepts of, uh, of economics and, um, in business suits, white shirt and tie to, uh, to quiet the yelping detractors on the side of that Kiev fascist, uh, regime. So, um, trade unions getting, uh, their due. It's very, very different. So here's what, uh, Litvinov says. What's your message to Obama? He was asked. He said, well, we want a negotiated settlement here. We'll talk about what that might be in just a second. But the negotiated settlement is something you can't have if you've got foreign troops on your territory. And we know now that the U.S. Uh, military is not just in western Ukraine, that Lvov area, but they're all the way to Mariupol and other areas in the far east, there's a recipe for uh, disaster. Uh, but Litvinov says, as long as we have foreign soldiers and foreign weapons being threatened or delivered onto our territory, uh, there's no peace. So tell Obama, um, says Litvinov, tell Obama and his administration, they must give the order to Kiev to stop these military operations, that this Donetsk is not interested in submitting to the diktats of the Brussels Eurocrats and Eurogarchs, but rather inclines towards the Eurasian Economic uh, Union. So, um, that's Litvinov. Now, of course, we met any number of other people. One of them is a very uh, experienced uh police and military police guy. He uh, is uh, part of the uh, Oman tradition, highly trained. O Oman played a big role in preventing a bloodbath 
back in 1990, 91, 92, when the Soviet Union broke apart, the Oman essentially kept it uh, as, as peaceful as it could be. It's also the Spetsnaz uh, training. So this then puts the, uh, the longer term perspective into uh, into the proper framework. This is uh, Police Commissioner Yuri, uh, veteran of the Berkut, his uh, Berkut, the riot police, that they were betrayed, as he said. The uh, Yanu- Yanukovych refused to give the order to uh, to brush aside these armed gangs, fascists with weapons and Molotov cocktails, burning police officers alive, shooting police officers, sniping, uh, as we've heard once in the, in the past, five minutes of gunfire and Maidan fascism would have would have ended. So uh, that's uh, that's uh, Yuri, and uh, he says that Ukraine is dead. Ukraine is finished. When did that happen? Just about a year ago, on the second of May, twenty fourteen, with that government building in Odessa, Odessa, on the Black Sea, when three hundred people, pro Russian, pro autonomy anti-Kiev, anti-Maidan, when they were burned alive and shot, because a lot of them were shot, uh, that was the end of Ukraine. Ukraine died that day, and uh, there's, there's no, uh, no going back. And this is, I think, um, the general idea of most of the people you talk to, be it in Moscow. We had a one-day series of excellent briefings from members of the Obshestvienaya Palata, that is to say the civic chamber or civic forum of the Russian Federation. It is a representative and advisory body. A lot of them said uh, the basis of any coexistence inside the same state of Lugansk and Donetsk on the one hand and the Lvov on the other. This is simply impossible. So we're going towards a two-state solution for Ukraine. And again, there's no, no reason to get particularly upset about that. It is a completely uh, artificial country assembled under the guidance of Hindenburg and Ludendorff in 1918. And uh, the fact Donetsk being put into Ukraine, uh, an interesting quote from none other than Lenin. Lenin was the one who insisted that Donetsk would not be part of Russia, but it would be part of this new Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, which a lot of them didn't want. Let me also point out uh, one of the other founders of the new state is Professor uh, Barishnikov. Professor Barishnikov uh, was for a number of months the rector of the in the University of Donetsk, uh, obviously a very refined uh, historian. And what he points out is the revolution, there was a revolutionary process. There was a real mass strike process of the middle class, including industrial workers, that produced the new state. And he points out, the revolution was the work of the young, I guess we'd say millennials, and older people, right? Post-war, baby boomers, if you must. And the group in the middle, I guess we'd say Generation X, um, waited. He quoted Chekhov saying, the intelligentsia is always very prudent, they wait to see who's going to win before they become engaged. So it's the young, the student generation, and the older generation. This important sociological model that he develops in this. And uh, Barishnikov also believes that there is no basis for the existence of a future federal state. Uh, and he's also adamant that all of the territory up to the old oblast of, of border should be uh, included. Now, there were people who were somewhat undisciplined, like Strelkov, as he talked about, right? The the Western media focused very much on this guy, Strelkov, last summer. But uh, these people have tended to recede into the background. You now have a uh, state structure emerging under Zakharchenko and uh, generals, right? One of the main generals. Comrade Motorola, uh, who is di- directing this uh, this defense. Now, 
Uh, we'll have much more to say about this uh, later in the broadcast, I hope, and then in uh, future broadcasts. But what's going to happen? A lot of people expect there'll be a, a spring offensive by the Kiev fascists, right? Remember that the, the classic position of the uh, of the Donetsk forces is the defensive, but of course, from time to time with uh, counterattacks because you you have to, right? There's no other way uh, to do it. So uh, as we were driving back from Donetsk, back to Rostov-on-Don inside Russia, I counted six Russian military convoys headed west towards the Ukrainian or Donetsk uh, border area. Uh, we have this anniversary, May 2nd, of the burning of the 300 uh, victims, anti-Maidan, anti-fascist people in Odessa. That is likely to be to trigger something on the part of Kiev. And then, of course, the May 9th, 70th anniversary of the uh, victory of the Soviet Union in the Great Patriotic War, itself the central event of the Second World War on a, on a world scale, uh, Unlikely that Pornoshenko and company will allow that to pass without some kind of an event. And I would uh, also, in the limited time we have, check up the article, How to Avert a Nuclear War, by General James E. Cartwright of the U.S. side and General Vladimir Dvorkin, D-V-O-R-K-I-N, April 19th, 2015, here in the New York Times, they point to the fact that you can have first strike, you can then have launch on warning or launch under attack, or second strike retaliation only. Uh, and we're unfortunately now in a much less regulated, more deregulated area in all of this than we were under the Cold War. The danger of the launch on warning, use them or lose them, is that puts the hair trigger on nuclear war. So it's time for the Obama administration to end this lunatic drill, pull out the advisors, 